Working now? Yeah. All right. Good morning again. Welcome to the Century Foundation event, Health Reform 2020. I'm Mark Zuckerman, president of TCF. It's great to see so many people here and many more across the country who are walking, working, uh, watching online. I want to start by extending a huge thanks to TCF fellows Jean Lambrew and Ellen Mons for their extraordinary leadership and persistence in first building the Affordable Care Act uh, with allies in Congress and then defending it and now helping to chart with you a new course, uh, an, the next wave of progressive health reform. I want to thank TCF fellow Harold Pollack, a distinguished academic and leader in public policy health public policy. Special thanks, too, to the American Prospect, and in particular, our founder and co-editor, Paul Starr, and publisher, Amy Lambrick. I also want to acknowledge uh, Chairman Bradley Abelow, who is here with us today, as well as TCF trustee, Sonal Shaw. Thank you for your unwavering support of this essential uh, work. I also want to thank the incredible team behind the scenes who have worked to make this event happen, including our VP of Communications, Lucy Muirhead, our event specialist, Mary, uh, Mariella Lazzoni, and our Director of Communications, Alex Edwards. As the title suggests, today we are looking forward on health care. Despite relentless efforts to repeal the ACA, the ACA is very much the law of the land. In 39 states using healthcare.gov, some 8.7 million Americans signed up in 2018 for coverage, nearly 95% of those who signed up last year, with potentially higher coverage in states running their own marketplaces. This is remarkable given the administration's actions to cut outreach efforts, to shorten enrollment periods, to eliminate cost-sharing subsidies for low-income people, and to generally create chaos and confusion about the future of the law. Today, most Americans have a favorable view of the ACA, as we'll hear more about later soon. This is a testament to the desire of millions of people across the country who wanted to expand coverage, not reduce it. To be sure, some lawmakers in D.C. will continue to attack the ACA specifically in consumer protections in health care generally as we saw with the recent repeal of the individual mandate in the GOP tax bill, these threats are real and persistent, and the Century Foundation will remain vigilant in thwarting them. But protecting recent gains is just not enough. Heading into this year's midterms and 2020 presidential race, we have a unique opportunity to build on the successes of the last decade and ensure even more Americans have quality, affordable health care. In short, 2017 was about defense. 2018 is our time to go on the health care offense. Today, we are kicking off a national discussion of what comes next with health reform. We've assembled the nation's leading health care experts and commentators to discuss various proposals to expand the Affordable Care Act, a number of which are detailed in a special issue of the American Prospect, which you all got a copy of at registration. While these proposals represent different approaches for health reform, they all assume a greater role for government. Some plans you'll hear discussed today are well known and would significantly alter our current system. Some are less known and would make more incremental but important changes. But all of them deserve careful consideration and debate. The ne next wave of health reform must be informed by data, research, and evidence. It should be taking into account important lessons of history and subjected, subjected to rigorous policy and budget analysis. It should be judged on its ability to tackle medical costs and make uh, coverage more affordable. It should be strategic and anticipate the counter arguments and mobilization of opponents. And finally, it should be designed to make health care affordable Health, uh, designed to make affordable health care coverage a reality for every American once and for all. We encourage everyone to join the conversation throughout the day on Twitter using the hashtag HealthReform2020 and follow us after this conference at TCF.org where we will continue our work on the next generation of health reform. Thank you again for coming and now I want to introduce Paul Starr, our partner for this event, co-founder, co-editor of the American Prospect. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to all of you at the Century Foundation who uh, helped put this uh, event together, to Jean and Lucy and Ben and uh, uh, Ellen. And, uh, terrific that uh, we've been able to assemble such a crowd, and thanks to all of you this morning uh, for coming. Uh, some of you may remember uh, in early 1993, a movie came out uh, called Groundhog Day, in which Bill Murray plays a character who is doomed to relive uh, the events of the same day, one time after another, until he gets things right. Now, the reason I remember it came out in early 1993 is that some of us working at the White House at that time on the health plan for the Clintons uh, had to recycle one time after another through the same issues. Um, and we found Groundhog Day was a perfect metaphor for our experience. Oh my God, are we going to have to do that memo about premiums versus payroll taxes again? And um, since then, um, I've thought, you know, maybe Groundhog Day is, um, is a pretty good metaphor for um, a lifetime of working on health care reform. I mean, coming to a conference like this, I had to, did I, was I at this conference 10 years ago? Uh, might I have been talking to the same people, some of the same people, uh, even, even 25 years ago? Now, this is a terrible thought for any of the younger people who've come in here, that you may have walked into this time warp where these people are reliving meetings that they have already had before. And, oh my God, could this be happening to you 10 years from now? But I want to assure you, this time, this time we are going to get it right. Uh, and the movie, and the movie uh, will end. Well, uh, Groundhog Day, it's an imperfect metaphor for healthcare reform because we have made progress. Let's not forget about that. We've made a great deal of uh, progress. So we're not in exactly the same uh, point we were uh, uh, years ago. But we've made progress often um, in uh, the most difficult and even painful way, uh, learning, from, uh, learning from defeat. And in fact, every major progressive healthcare program in the United States was enacted on the rebound from uh, setbacks, from earlier setbacks uh, when uh, reformers had hoped to uh, enact a more ambitious program. That's, that is actually the history of healthcare reform in the United States. Uh, so without uh, uh, emphasizing the failures, I want to instead emphasize the rebound strategies that people have followed in the past in the wake of previous defeats. It was, it was just a bit over a century ago in, uh, in 1915 that the American Association for Labor Legislation, uh, a group of policy experts at that time, uh, put forward the first concrete proposal uh, for a um, publicly financed uh, health insurance uh, program, employer-employee uh, financed health insurance program. They brought that up at the state level. They campaigned in California, in Illinois, in New York, and so forth. In every state, it met defeat. They tried to come back in the 1930s. Uh, uh, health insurance was originally part of the mandate of the Committee on Economic Security that, that shaped the Social Security Act, but the Roosevelt administration decided it was just one thing too many, and they put it off. And Roosevelt put it off again in 1938, was working on it at the time he died. Ultimately, it was Harry Truman who gave the speech that Samuel Rosenman was writing for Roosevelt at the time of Roosevelt's death. And it was Truman who first uh, as a, uh, put forward a, 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 what we, was called national health insurance, what they now called single payer. And, uh, uh, and that, that proposal was soundly defeated in the late 40s. In fact, there never was a Truman bill. Uh, so the, the reformers at that time, the policy people, people, really the counterparts of people assembled in this room today, uh, regrouped and asked themselves, well, what could they, how could they push things ahead? Well, they already had Social Security, so why not build a, a benefit for seniors on the structure that they'd already established? And, and the, the idea originally was just for a 60-day hospital benefit. That was the original Medicare uh, idea in the early 50s. And, 
uh, John Kennedy campaigned on it in 1960, and then Lyndon Johnson, and finally the moment arrived in, uh, in 1965. Then the Republicans counterproposed uh, a voluntary program that would include physicians' coverage. Hmm. The AMA counterproposed a program that would involve um, the states, uh, with, but exclusively serving the poor. And of course, it was out of these different proposals uh, that the 1965 legislation emerged uh, uh, chiefly with the encouragement of Lyndon Johnson, but at the hands of, of uh, Wilbur Mills, who was the chair of the, of the Ways and Means Committee in the House. So they, they used um, uh, this rebound strategy from all these previous defeats. They combined it with counterproposals. They were able uh, to produce uh, what still remains the single most significant uh, reform in American history. Right after uh, the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid, um, Ted Kennedy and others raised the standard of national health insurance once again on the social insurance model. And uh, when I, as a graduate student, when I first uh, became uh, interested in these issues in the early 1970s, uh, it was considered a certainty that national health insurance would be approved. After all, at that time, not only was Kennedy supporting it, but so was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had his own uh, proposal. In fact, by 1974, he had a pretty ambitious proposal. The Republican alternative to uh, uh, Kennedy's plan was a very conservative idea, an employer mandate. An employer mandate. That was the conservative position at that time as an alternative to a purely uh, governmental uh, program. Of course, that moment was lost. That moment was lost. It turned out to be another setback uh, for reform. But in the, and then came Carter and Reagan, but then another rebound strategy emerged. And here we can credit Henry Waxman in particular for the idea of building on Medicaid. Medicaid was an afterthought in 1965. Medicaid was not the ideal that reformers originally had in mind for universal coverage, but uh, working with Republicans, Waxman was able to make incremental improvements, expansions year by year. Uh, for low-income pregnant women and children. And gradually, Medicaid became a more substantial health insurance program for the poor over that period of time as a result of that rebound strategy. Well, move up to the late early, early 90s, and Democrats were once again advocating a universal uh, system. And quite a few people who are in this room today were part of that effort and the various alternatives that were that were uh, uh, being advocated in the early 90s and uh, uh, resulting in that uh, effort uh, under, under Bill Clinton. Um, and that again produced a defeat for an ambitious uh, program uh, for universal coverage and cost containment. But there emerged afterwards rebound strategies. Again, imperfect uh, but uh, important rebound strategies. Uh, CHIP in 97 was an example of a rebound strategy in many ways. Similar to Medicare, choose a sympathetic age group uh, and use the kind of support that you can get if you focus on one particular group and then building really on the Medicaid expansion idea. Really, the CHIP was in some ways a combination of the first two rebound strategies. Um, and the Affordable Care Act really emerged as a rebound from the defeat of the Clinton plan, drawing lessons about what uh, the political system uh, could absorb and where the compromises needed to be made uh, in order to uh, advance the cause of universal coverage. And so we now find ourselves in yet another period of setbacks. Um, and we now, I think, can see more clearly what it would have been uh, almost impossible to anticipate in advance of the ACA. So this is no criticism, really, of the ACA. Um, the, the, the points of vulnerability. Um, the limitations uh, that uh, opponents uh, were able to exploit. Of course, number one, which we knew at the time, was the, is the individual mandate, always unpopular, um, and now repealed. How serious the consequences will be of its repeal, we can't yet fully tell. But that was certainly the number one vulnerability uh, all along, and now fully exploited by Republicans. Um, uh, a second vulnerability uh, was the Supreme Court created uh, an option for states uh, not to expand Medicaid, 
Um, that really could not have been anticipated in advance, but it has prevented uh, the law from uh, uh, fully, uh, being fully extended over uh, the whole country. Uh, a third vulnerability is um, hostile administrative action. And since the law does leave a great deal up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, there are a lot of issues, uh, like the benefit package and so forth, instead of it, like in the Clinton Health Security Act, the whole benefit package was going to be spelled out. That was not done this time. But there, there are a lot of administrative ways of undermining and eroding uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act, uh, the waivers that can be used for Medicaid, uh, a whole variety of strategies that this administration uh, is, uh, is exploiting. Uh, a fourth area of vulnerability has to do really with um, the compromises of uh, the law itself, which effectively took a lot of the structure of employer-based insurance and the marketplace as given, did not try to uh, uh, change it. Many people uh, have experienced in these years increasing deductibles in their employer-provided insurance. They may blame the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is not responsible for that, but they may be unhappy about what has happened in the years since because they feel their coverage is deteriorating and something's being done for other people. Um, there is uh, the, um, the vulnerability that comes from the design of the marketplace. We have seen a tremendous amount of consolidation, growth of monopoly power throughout the whole healthcare sector. Uh, and uh, the design of the ACA marketplaces, in part because there is no public option, uh, makes them vulnerable to uh, the, uh, 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 the problems created by, uh, by concentrations of, uh, of market power. Um, so um, in all those ways, um, we have been left with a program which is, um, in some respects, wounded. Um, not dead, but wounded don't know how deep these wounds are. Uh, we don't know how badly the program will bleed. Uh, our challenge, I think, without fully knowing what these consequences are going to be over the next several years, our challenge is to try to see around the corner, to try to think ahead, to try to think what, how, do we, uh, how do we rebound from this Trump era in the case of health policy? How do we build the next phase of reform? What are the strengths uh, that, uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, from the various uh, reforms that have been enacted over the years? And we have these different structures. We have Medicare. We have Medicaid. We have the ACA marketplaces. Uh, those each, each of them provides uh, some degree of opportunity for the expansion of coverage and uh, cost containment. And during the day today, uh, we're going to, in the various panels, we're going to be considering these different frameworks of policy, these different platforms for change, and the degree to which we can go back to them. We can revise them. We can add to them. We can try to fix what uh, was imperfect uh, the last time around. And um, now this is, uh, uh, we don't, uh, have, as some people in other countries have, one great historic reform that gave us um, a pretty good system. Uh, we have had to uh, build things piecemeal, imperfectly, make all kinds of compromises along the way. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this, is, this is really the fate of those of us who've become involved in healthcare reform. It is only uh, uh, a career for the long distance runner for people who are willing to come back and, uh, and keep working at it. And I think the people we have today are just the people uh, who you want to see working at those questions. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jean Lambrew, and I'm a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Before introducing this session, I'd like to say a few words about how we organize this day. First, my colleagues on stage will and I will discuss the component parts and challenges for different types of plans. Subsequently, we'll hear from three moderated panels focusing on Medicare-based options, 
Medicaid and state-based options, and ACA-based options. We have outstanding moderators who are also reporters for those panels who will ask most of the questions. But time permitting, they will also read questions from the audience. We have put index cards in your program folders, have more at the back. If you have a question, write it down and pass it down the row to the outer seat uh, of your rows on the left and the right. You will have staff that will pick it up. And you may also drop off your questions at the back at a table in the back. Uh, in the interest of time, we also verbally will not pro provide the type of introductions that our illustrious speakers deserve during the day, but you can find their bios in the folders that you have. And third, also in the interest of time, we have a strict time limit. So do not be alarmed when you hear a bell, unless you are a speaker. Bell? Yep. So that's for our speakers to make sure that we keep going because we really want to make sure that everybody is heard. And do please hold your applause till the end of the panels to again give us more time to talk. Last but not least, this is the beginning of a discussion, not just a one-day event. We hope to generate as many questions as answers throughout the course of this conference. And to that end, let me begin with a discussion of the considerations for all types of proposals. With me on stage, to my left, is Sherry Gleed, Dean of NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service and former Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. To her left is Larry Levitt, Senior Vice President for Health Reform at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Sherry will discuss why more options are needed and I'll discuss the different starting points for plans and Larry will explore what's public in public health reform plans. We'll begin with Sherry. If I go in the right direction with the slides. Nope, you can sit right here. I can sit. Oh, that's there great. There we go. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Is your um, microphone on? There you go. Yeah. Um, thank you, Paul, for that great introduction, which actually takes away my first slide. It's all good. Um, we've been working at this for something like 100 years. Healthcare reform in the U.S. is a long-standing process. It has been, on the whole, a process of failure, disappointment, and frustration. Um, but, and, you know, intermittent small gains and really two brief shining moments, uh, 1965 with the passage of Medicare and 2010 with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it's actually worth, I looked, last night I read the beginning of the Medicare statute, and it's actually worth doing, um, because what you see when you read it is how full of compromise it is, how it begins by saying Medicare will not interfere with the practice of medicine, it will not, not interfere with the sale of private health insurance, people can have other coverage, you can do whatever you like, here's Medicare. Um, and interestingly, when Medicare was first passed, when it was first initiated, uh, it increased insurance coverage, the percentage of people in the United States with insurance coverage by about four and a half percent. If you remember what's been happening with the ACA, we're now at about seven, eight percent. So in fact, although we think about Medicare as this enormous uh, development in the U.S. healthcare system, it began as an acorn and grew into an oak, and that's important to remember. Um, things don't have to start big in order to have, in order to have big effects. What I want to talk about a little bit is sort of how we get somewhere and what options are needed. And now I'm a dean of a public policy school, so I spend a lot of time among eightfold paths and logic models. Do these things mean anything to any of you? Yes. I, and what I'm trying to do is not present a new one, because goodness knows we have enough of them. Um, but sort of my sense from being a, a survivor of one of the failed efforts and, and, and one of the successful ones of how these things play out over time. And really what happens is that we start with a set of goals and priorities. There are a bunch of policy options. We draft some bills. The bills hit up against some constraints. They get modified. They go to Congress. Who knows what happens there? Um, the constraints lead you to go back to the policy options. The policy options go back into the bills. This is a highly iterative process. Right now, we're in a place where a lot of bills are being written. Now, that's actually a normal thing, because legislators communicate by writing bills. I was thinking about this. They don't communicate by writing policy options. They, they tell us what they're thinking by writing pieces of legislation and introducing them. But bills have a coherence, which may not be the right thing, right, the thing that we need at this moment in order to move forward. I think what we need at this moment in order to move forward is more policy options, so that when our bills hit constraints, we have something to go back to and more co 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 cohesion around the goals and priorities that we want to pursue. Um, we need to actually uh, have more op opportunities to dial up and down our bills um, once they start to hit the constraints. So with colleagues at NYU, um, no, wrong way. We've been trying to look at proposals, the bills that are out there, both at the state and the federal level. Um, what are their common 
features, and these are some of the common features that we see in many of these proposals, reviewing them across the board. And I, I you know, put them all together, what you have is something that is very coherent and very attractive uh, and looks really good, which is all wonderful, um, and, and, and seems like something we want, and I think that that's all true. Uh, the challenge is that these tend to be fairly monolithic bills. Oh, my, my jigsaw puzzle didn't appear. Um, they look like a jigsaw puzzle. It, they all fit together in nice, coherent ways. And the problem with a monolithic bill is it makes it really hard to dial it up and to dial it down when you start hitting constraints. The challenge is, what are you going to change? What are you going to get rid of when, uh, as inevitably, you will hit, you will hit a problem? So. These, I, 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 what are the constraints? There are so many constraints that you couldn't fit them on one slide, and I don't want you to read them. Um, there are pragmatic constraints. How are you going to get this through all the different places that might, they might go through? There are political constraints. There are constraints in the nature of the product. There are constraints in the nature of our healthcare system. There are economic constraints. And there are things we never even thought of that will be thrown in our face as constraints when the time comes. Because of all that, it is important that we not only develop jigsaw puzzles that fit together coherently and are attractive, but that we develop a set of building blocks that can be put together in other forms when one of these constraints drives out the proposal that looks most attractive to us. So this idea of building blocks and trying to think about policy options, rather than focusing entirely on the development of bills, is not only a matter of policy design and policy analysis, I think it's also a matter of rhetoric. And here is a challenge that I think that we all face in the, in the focus on coherent and attractive bills. Um, I think that the challenge is if we focus on the options and not on the goals and priorities that we're trying to pursue, then when we hit up against the constraints that we hit up against, when we enter the congressional process, um, when we are waiting for Al Franken to be declared the winner of the Minnesota Senate race in 2009, because you can't move forward without 60 votes in the Senate, right? Remember, we do all of these things by a knife edge property. Everything is very, very tight. When you're waiting, are you going to lose your supporters, your grassroots, the, the people who really care about health reform, because they're not concerned about the goals, but they are really focused on the options. If you can keep um, focus on goals and priorities, then when you have to make compromises, when you have to constrain, when you have to face the constraints, you can hold your coalitions together. If your coalition is based on how you're going to do something and not why you're going to do it, you face a real challenge, I think, when you actually are up against uh, those constraints. So where can we get to more means in order to get to our ends? Uh, and how can we and how can we frame that? I think the first thing to really focus on, which we have not been doing, I think, and uh, among progressives, is what is the big goal now? What is our big challenge? Is it reducing the share of uninsured to two percent? Is it making people who have coverage more financially secure? Um, what will we give up in favor of what? And I think that is pretty critical. One of the things that to me seems like a feature of the success of the Affordable Care Act is that there was a laser focus on getting as many people covered as you possibly could for the amount of money on the table, which is the reason that the ACA had a much bigger impact on the uninsurance rate than Medicare did. Medicare was not focused on getting as many people as possible covered. Medicare was focused on getting seniors covered. Turned out quite a lot of seniors had coverage already. That wasn't a coverage-focused proposal. The ACA is a coverage-focused proposal, and so that's what you got out of the law. So here we need to be thinking more, I think, about what are our goals and how will we prioritize among them. And then uh, what are the, the potential uh, policy options we can, we can use to get to them. Now, where can we look for policy options? I think you're going to hear about a lot of them at uh, the conversation today. But I think you can also look a little bit internationally. Um, and I think there's a couple things that you can see when you look internationally, and two of them that really stand out to me. One is that all high-income countries except the United States have universal health insurance or something that is indistinguishable from universal health insurance. And there has been a pretty consistent shift, if you look at a timeline over history, towards more universal and broader coverage across all these countries. Um, universal health insurance, we would say in sort of economic terms, appears to be institutionally optimal. It looks like it's a sensible thing to do because we see country after country moving in that direction. On the other hand, there are no two high-income countries, you can't find them, that operate their health systems in the same way. Every country has its own distinctive health care system. And moreover, not only did they just start as a matter of historical antecedent with different health systems, there is no apparent tendency towards convergence. 
We don't see the multi-payer systems moving towards single-payer systems. We don't see the single-payer systems moving towards multi-payer systems. There, are, there appears to be no specific health system organization that is universally optimal. That means there's lots of options on the table. There are lots of directions we can go. What are some of the things that large, large high-income countries are doing that we might want to think about? Aspects in which they change. I'm going to be short because I talk so fast. So uh, here are some that really struck us when we were looking across the OECD using the same framework we were looking at to compare plans that are on the table in the United States. So what we did is we looked at what are people doing, what are the bills that are being introduced in state and federal legislatures, what are their dimensions, and then what are those dimensions when we look across the OECD. So one of them is many countries have a national regulatory framework and considerable subnational autonomy. Um, and actually, the extent of subnational autonomy for, was, for a while was increasing among many of these countries. So you look at places like Australia, Canada, and Germany, these are countries with federal systems where there are national rules and quite a bit of uh, regional variation. Um, there are many countries that have intentionally two or multi-tiered healthcare systems. Um, Australia, England, Germany, Switzerland, these are all countries that are quite explicitly multi-tiered in terms of their healthcare system. Some people have faster access, more choices than others do. I'm not saying we ought to do this. I'm saying there are lots of countries that have this on the table. It's an option we should be thinking about. Some countries have a narrower universal benefit and means-tested additional benefits. Places like Canada that doesn't have a pharma benefit from, for everyone. Um, Australia, Singapore. Um, so could we think about that? Should we be thinking about going uh, national, going to a universal benefit that is narrower, and thinking about means-tested supplementation? Out-of-pocket payments. Um, we are by no means the only country in the world with out-of-pocket payments or even substantial out-of-pocket payments for service use at the point of service. Many countries have done this. This is a this is actually a dimension on which we have regular twisting of the dial up and down among countries, one that we should be thinking about here as well. Um, a lot of differences among countries in how hospitals are financed, um, and particularly places that use a com combination of budget and activity-based financing. Global budgets for hospitals are largely on the way out. You actually see movement more towards activity-based financing in hospitals across the OECD. So countries that have combinations of global budgets and activity-based financing, how do we think about that? Uh, my uh, last one is probably the one that is most co consistent across these countries, which is aggressive regulation of provider pricing in the public system, in large public systems. So uh, most countries are even when they have competing health insurance plans, regulate the prices that providers can charge within those plans, how might we think about this? So I've, I, I think there, these are just a subset of policy options that I think we might want to include in our arsenal of, uh, of tools that we would like con uh, members of Congress to have when they hit the constraints and when they have to make the political compromises. That means they need to be developed, costed out, analyzed, <laughs> and move forward, and now I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. So I'd like to begin my discussion about the fact that it would be much easier to have this conversation if we were starting from scratch, or if we were able to take down the existing infrastructure and rebuild. But uh, the fact is that trying to do a so-called big bang approach to health reform is challenged by three things. The first is the health system size. We spend more than any other nation, $3.3 billion trillion in nearly 18% of our economy on healthcare. Second, we have very strong vested interests. For example, healthcare is not only one of the largest employers in the nation, but it is the most lucrative, accounting for nine of the 10 highest paid occupations. And third, people fear change, especially when it comes to healthcare, no matter how flawed it is. Uh, that is why virtually all proposals, even the most dramatic, have starting points or phase-ins, and these matter. Starting in the wrong place could lead to a retrenchment or backlash, and even the best planned phase-in may stall, as has happened historically. So, as much attention needs to be paid to the pathway as the destinations. Here I'll discuss four possible approaches. The first is a public plan could start or enter the system where private plans end, in other words, filling gaps in private coverage. This is the history of Medicare and Medicaid. These programs were needed because private insurers did not cover the poor, the old, or people with disabilities. 
Since then, these programs, CHIP, and the ACA filled in coverage gaps by population group. But as recent attention has focused, there are still potential gaps by geography, so-called bear counties in which private insurers have shown very li little interest in serving. Medicare X, introduced last fall, for example, provides a public plan initially in areas with one insurer, low competition, uh, or limited provider uh, supply. The main advantage of this type of appro approach is that it's hard to say no to a public plan when there is no alternative. This argumentation is similar to that in the right to try debate over experimental drugs and helps explain why Republicans have embraced this approach in the past. Part D uh, has a public plan fallback should an area lack two, at least two prescription drug plans and Senator Snow supported a trigger public plan option in 2009. Deploying public plans in some areas may increase support for its general availability as well. However, creating a full-blown public plan fallback may not be necessary to solve this problem. We saw in 2018 that despite policy changes, all corners of the country had marketplace plans, albeit expensive ones. That problem could be addressed with regulatory policies, including one that John Hallahan will discuss later today, allowing private plans to use Medicare rates. There is also a concern about whether this, this would be a temporary stopgap. Once a public plan is in an area, will a private plan return given its challenges in offering as low prices? And politically, it is not a coincidence that most areas at risk of bear counties are in red states that have done little to implement the Affordable Care Act. This, makes, they, this may create extra resistance to passing this type of proposal. Second, we have a history of targeting expansions by age. Clearly, Medicare is age-based, but over the years, we have also expanded Medicaid and then CHIP and most recently adult dependent coverage to children and young adults. We've seen a return in interest of older Americans with a revival of what Bill Clinton proposed as a Medicare buy-in, allowing people over the age of 50 or 55 to be covered by Medicare. As Professor Starr will describe in greater detail in the next panel, so-called midlife Medicare has the advantage of being a natural extension of a popular proposal or program. And from a policy perspective, shifting people ages 50 to 64 from private insurance to Medicare helps lower the average costs of both programs. This juxtaposition of private coverage and Medicare, though, highlights the differences in these programs. For example, should this group of people get Medicare's long-term care benefits or private plans annual out-of-pocket limits? Another concern is about equity. Older adults are, on average, more insured and have higher incomes than young adults. Millennials may not be so supportive, supportive of versions of Medicare for more that just focus on older adults. And third, since this proposal literally changes Medicare rather than building a new program based on it, it could be vulnerable to so-called Medicare, the tactic of having seniors opposed to any changes to their program. A third approach is one that was debated for inclusion in the Affordable Care Act giving people the choice. The House passed version of the Affordable Care Act included a public plan modeled on, but different from Medicare, offered side by side with private plans in exchanges. Jacob Hacker's Medicare Part E proposal, which Kathy Herwitt will discuss in the next panel, would give large employers this choice as well. New to the debate, Michael Sparer later today will describe offering Medicaid as an option to all as well. This either-or approach to, has an appeal in a nation that values the concept of choice. It can simulate competition and value in private plans, as CBO affirmed in 2009. And if the public plan wins and gets the most enrollment, it will be a transition propelled by individuals' decisions rather than government fiat. Choice, however, can undermine a system of insurance. People know their health status better than insurers or the government. So sick people would likely gravitate to the public plan, while healthy people would choose private plans, or vice versa, depending on how the program is designed. A poor design could mean that private insurers cry foul and drop out of the market. However, policies to prevent this from happening, like increasing Medicare rates, tend to undermine some of the benefits of the public option in the first place. Additionally, for choice, uh, mo choice models to work, policymakers would need to periodically adjust it as has been true in Medicare Advantage. 
This kind of ongoing calibration may not be feasible in today's, today's politically polarized environment. Lastly, a historical point of entry for public programs has been for people with serious health needs or high costs. Medicaid covers certain people with disabilities, as does Medicare. Harold Pollack will later discuss the limitations of both the current system and current proposals for individuals with disabilities. Expanding their eligibility for public programs is one option. Another, which my colleague Ellen Mons and I described in the Health Affairs blog last month, would keep them in private plans but better support that coverage through reinsurance. Reinsurance reimburses health insurers for their highest claims. We propose such a public program for all private plans, including employer plans. This is because in 2015, private plans paid more than Medicare for the top 1% most expensive Americans. Such claims would be paid for at Medicare rates. Public reinsurance has the benefit of lowering premiums and allowing people to keep their plans. It builds on a well-established role for government, helping people who face financial hardship, as the federal government does, with flood insurance and other natural disasters. It is also the only proposals in both the Republicans' 2017 repeal and replace bills and Democratic alternatives. Public reinsurance, however, would primarily replace private reinsurance, and some employers may balk at the strings attached to the money. Because it is a back-end pr program, employers and insurers, rather than the government and the members of Congress who voted to enact it, would likely get the credit for its results. And like other proposals that lower reimbursement, this one could also engender opposition from physicians and hospitals, which is a theme we'll hear, I think, throughout this day. I want to conclude, though, by saying that some of these approaches do depend on the endpoint, such as whether you're moving towards a Medicare for All pr proposal. But all do depend on the policy choices and values of leaders in some future debate. Regardless, these approaches would move us toward a more affordable quality healthcare system, which itself is progress, which is why we should focus on these paths as well as the endpoint. And with that, I will turn this over to Larry. Do the slides. There we go. Thanks, Jean. Um, <clears throat> well, I, well, I have to say, I've never been sure whether my inherent pessimism is a function of the fact that I spent my adult life working on health policy, as Paul Starr suggested, uh, or my Russian heritage, um, uh, which may not be in vogue these days. But uh, I will—I uh, promise to fight through this pessimism, at least for uh, at least for this morning. Um, so we're going to focus a lot of today on the idea of health reform through uh, an expansion of public plans. Uh, potentially to the whole population, as in a single-payer system or Medicare for all. Um, this distinction of uh, public versus private insurance uh, used to be quite clear, um, but I think it's been very muddied uh, more recently as we've expanded uh, government financing of private insurance through the Affordable Care Act um, and expanded the use of private insurance through uh, Medicare, through Medicare Advantage in Part D, uh, and in Medicaid as well. Um, so what I want to spend some time doing is try to tease out what I think we mean when we talk about health reform based on a public plan, um, which I think is important as we think about how to design uh, such a system, uh, and I think also important in thinking about how to explain it uh, or sell it to the public. Um, the role of government is certainly central uh, to, to all of these proposals, as, as Paul suggested. Um, so thinking through also how to govern uh, a public plan in a way that bolsters credibility among the public as well as healthcare providers uh, may be the key to its, its success. Um, so we tend to focus a lot on uh, who pays for, for healthcare, and that's certainly important, arguably the most important aspect of, of a health reform plan. Uh, but it's actually not helpful, I think, in thinking about a public versus a private plan in the context of, of health reform. Um, certainly any public plan will involve a substantial amount of government uh, funding and, and subsidies, uh, but not all programs that involve government subsidies are necessarily public in the way I think we, we mean it or are talking about it today. Um, I would offer four characteristics for what I think uh, defines a public versus a private uh, health reform plan. Uh, the first is that accessibility of coverage is guaranteed uh, for all eligible beneficiaries and not dependent on private business decisions. Um, I'm not talking about an entitlement here in a, in a legal sense. 
um, for example, the CHIP program um, is, um, uh, is, is certainly a public plan as I think we think about it, but the CHIP program is actually not an individual entitlement in a technical sense. Uh, on the other hand, the tax subsidy of employer-based insurance uh, is in effect an entitlement through the tax system, uh, but I don't think any of us would think of employer-based health insurance as, as public uh, in the context of health reform. Um, no, what I'm talking about is whether the government is responsible for guaranteeing access to coverage uh, for everyone eligible for whatever plan we're talking about. Uh, that's true in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, it's not true in market-oriented systems uh, like the ACA marketplace where availability is dependent on decisions by insurance companies. And I think this is a fundamental uh, decision. Now, if a public option were part of, part of the ACA marketplaces, I think you could credibly argue that it is much more of a public plan, uh, but that's not, that's not where we are. Uh, the second is that the plan itself does not uh, earn profits, is not a profit-making enterprise sort of obvious if we're talking about a public plan, uh, but I think less clear is the extent of profit making in the underlying healthcare system within a health reform plan based on a public plan. Uh, some single player proposals, for example, would prohibit for-profit hospitals, uh, but currently in Medicare, uh, for-profit hospitals certainly participate in the program, as do for-profit labs and all kinds of other profit-making uh, healthcare institutions, uh, and even insurers, for-profit insurers participate in Medicare through Medicare Advantage and Part D programs. So the idea of profit um, uh, is, is, um, uh, is, is, is somewhat muddy when we're talking about health reform plans uh, based on a public approach. Um, now, I would say third, a, a major impetus for health reform proposals, and, and Paul mentioned this, uh, based on public plans, uh, whether we're talking about single payer, or Medicare, or Medicaid buy-ins, or a public option, is to lower costs for consumers. Uh, and I would argue this is central. Um, certainly we talk as health policy experts about uh, cost containment and lowering uh, health care costs for the nation, uh, but for this to be salient for consumers, it needs to focus on lowering what they pay, uh, particularly directly uh, for health care. Um, some of that cost relief in these plans certainly comes from lowering profits, lowering administrative costs, uh, but I think mostly the fact that uh, uh, the public plan uh, the, the, most of the reason a public plan lowers costs for consumers is because it regulates in some way the rates paid to uh, health care providers. Um, and as Sherry talked about, uh, regulating provider rates seems central um, to, the, uh, to the health systems in, in uh, all high-income countries regardless of, of how they're structured. Um, now, I'm not arguing that a public program or a public plan is inherently uh, um, uh, incompatible with market-oriented mechanisms, but I think price regulation is a big part of the appeal of, uh, of these public plan-based uh, health reform approaches. Um, if, for example, Medicare were transformed into a premium support system based entirely on market-based pricing by insurers, um, I suspect we wouldn't be hearing a lot about uh, Medicare for All from uh, people left of center. Um, finally, and, and this is almost definitional, um, a, public plan is, a public plan is accountable to elected officials and ultimately to voters. Um, the government is the decision maker here. Uh, for some people that's a good thing, for others that's uh, not such a good thing uh, in these proposals. Um, now a couple examples. Um, uh, Medicare, I think we would all agree, is a, uh, a public plan. Many single-payer proposals talk about Medicare for all, even if they're not necessarily delivered through Medicare itself. Uh, but clearly, Medicare is the kind of public plan that I think advocates have in mind. Um, and it certainly does meet my four-part four test. Um, uh, traditionally, Medicare, traditional Medicare is available everywhere. Um, it's accountable to the President and Congress, and it's not a profit-making enterprise itself. Uh, provider rates are regulated, uh, though interestingly, provider rates are not regulated in all cases. Uh, for example, through Medicare Part D, as we know, uh, uh, prices paid for drugs are, are not regulated. Um, they're instead negotiated by PBMs and Part D plans. Um, for-profit insurers, uh, while Medicare is not a profit-making entity itself, for-profit insurers certainly play an increasingly big role through Medicare Advantage and Part D. Uh, but I think the fact that they're paid in a, in a fairly formulaic way um, distinguishes it from uh, the ACA marketplaces. Um, and I think potentially most importantly, traditional Medicare, Medicare exists as a backup everywhere. The availability of Medicare is not dependent on the decisions by private insurers. 
Um, now, the ACA marketplace has many elements of a public plan. It's publicly accountable. Uh, it's not profit-making, um, but it's fundamentally a very market-oriented system. Uh, business decisions by insurers, as we've seen over the last several years, uh, determine the availability of coverage and the amount that people pay for coverage, uh, at least people not eligible for subsidies. Um, there can be bare counties where coverage uh, would cease to exist entirely. Uh, and even for active exchanges, uh, we'll hear from Peter Lee later uh, from California, even in these active exchanges that negotiate premiums, there's really no element of price regulation uh, in, in the marketplaces. Now, the idea of government control is for advocates the main selling point uh, of health reform based on a public, public plan. Uh, it means accountability, less profit for industry, and lower costs for consumers. Of course, greater government control over health care is also one of the most potent arguments uh, against the idea of a public plan. Uh, our polling shows that a majority of people support the idea of Medicare for all, a national health insurance plan, a single payer plan, uh, but when presented with the argument that it would give, give government too much control over health care, support typically turns to opposition. And that's true for Medicare buy-in proposals as well. Um, now, of course, the health insurance industry is not exactly popular either. Um, so uh, our current system based on private insurance is not necessarily uh, the most credible either. Um, arguably the only thing less popular than a healthcare system built on private insurance would be a healthcare system run by oil companies. Um, <laughs> now, the controversial nature of government's role in the healthcare system I think requires us to think about how a public plan uh, would be governed. Um, arguably, uh, one of the more incremental approaches that Jean talked about, like uh, Medicare for More, Medicaid for More, could certainly be built on existing uh, government institutions, CMS, state-based Medicaid agencies, uh, et cetera. Um, but I think when thinking about a more expansive approach or an approach that uh, you would expect would lead to um, a public plan covering most or all of the population, um, I think it requires thinking through some difficult questions about how such a plan uh, would be governed. Um, and these questions, I think, have big, big implications for um, how that public plan would react over time uh, to changes in the healthcare system, but also how much credibility it would have uh, with the public and with healthcare providers. Um, and I think key to this is kind of balancing the idea of, of political accountability. Um, accountability to the president, accountability to Congress, um, and uh, the political independence of the plan. You know, there, that in some sense the plan is, um, uh, is, is above politics as, as usual. Uh, and I'll finish up here uh, quickly. Um, and I would just throw out a few questions that I think we should think about during the day. Um, you know, whether such a plan should be governed uh, through a typical uh, administrative agency uh, like CMS, um, or should we think about quasi-governmental uh, institutions? Um, should we think about boards and, and commissions uh, running such a, a public plan as opposed to a, a single administrator? Um, and I think thinking really hard, uh, and certainly many of us have done this in the past uh, in other plans and, and pieces of legislation. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh oh, I've been belled. I've been belled. <laughs> uh, legislative versus uh, delegated, delegated authority. Uh, and uh, throwing out very quickly two more questions. Uh, one is financing. Certainly, the, the, the uh, structure of financing is critical to health reform plans and determines winners and losers. Uh, but I think the nature of the financing is also important, whether there's a dedicated funding source. Uh, for a public plan. Uh, you know, the worst thing one could imagine is a, a public plan covering the entire population allowed to lapse for several months, as we've just seen with CHIP, uh, because Congress can't, can't uh, authorize it and, and fund it, even though it actually doesn't require uh, any funding. Um, and I would just close with, uh, I think, three challenges for, for the discussion today and in, in the years ahead. One is to create a plan that's simple. Um, and God knows our current system is, is not simple, and I think we're all vulnerable to creating uh, plans that uh, are sort of jigsaw puzzles, as Sherry suggested. Um, two, that it's sustainable, both politically and financially. Um, and third, uh, that it's not scary. Uh, if a plan is scary to the public, then it's, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Thank you, Larry. Sherry, do you have a question? Sure. I always have a question. So I have a question for Larry. And I, I actually want to... I want to 
strike at the heart of your argument um, and basically say, I don't think public is a binary thing. And I think we should stop thinking of it as a binary thing. I think publicness is, uh, is a dial. And so let me give you a couple of examples where you said something and I thought, wait a second, you just said the opposite. Chip, entirely run by private insurance companies. If they don't want to play, they don't come to the table, those are business decisions. But we would all say Chip is a public plan. And conversely, Medicare in 1965, which did not regulate provider prices at all, we would still say Medicare in 1965 was a public plan. So it seems to me that publicness, the VA is a public plan. It's a lot more regulated than Medicare, which is different than Medicaid, which is different than CHIP. And all of these have degrees of publicness. So wouldn't it be more sensible to be thinking about publicness and not public? Um. I, I would completely agree to that. And uh, I didn't contradict myself, did I, actually? You, you, said, <laughs> you, said, you said, you know, there can't be business yeah. decisions. And then you said CHIP is a public plan. And I was like, wait a second. No, but I, I, I think there are, um, I, 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 uh, in a sense, I think this idea of public versus private is, is absolutely the wrong conversation to have. Uh, and we need some language to talk about what we um, are, are thinking about. Um, but it really is not the right distinction. And the right distinction is what, what are the elements of, of the plan. Um, and I think that this idea that coverage is, is, is guaranteed, that someone is accountable for ensuring uh, that everyone eligible for this plan actually can be covered, um, that that's not dependent on uh, private business decisions is key. And that's certainly true in CHIP. I mean, if state runs a CHIP program, um, they've got to guarantee coverage to people who are eligible, um, waiting lists aside. Uh, the marketplaces really, really are uh, government financing of an organized market, uh, and I think that's um, uh, that's very different. But you know, it, it inevitably, I mean, there there is no plan we're going to have or or imagine that's going to be purely public in the sense that that uh, uh, that we used to think it was. Yeah, I mean, in, inherently. It's, it's, yeah, and I'll add, take this one step further, and then you can ask a question, which is. Part D is always an interesting one to me, right? Because it does guarantee access. There is a fallback should two or more prescription drug plans, which are private organizations, not participate. It's heavily subsidized, more so than the marketplace. Is that public or private? Yeah, no, I think, I think part, part D is the, um, I mean, Part D feels very much like what the marketplace would feel like if there were a public option fallback, I think. And, and to me, that, that is, um, that's in the realm of possibility here. Um, you know, a, a plan with a very market-oriented pricing structure, but with substantial government subsidies and a guarantee that you can actually, that the program will actually deliver coverage to people. You could probably have a fallback without a public option. You could have competitive bidding for a fallback. I'm just saying, all I'm trying to do is say you could, this, the, the, the set of choices is really broad. I, no, no, I, I, I would agree with that. But I, I, but I also think there, there is, um, I think the appeal of a, of a quote unquote public plan for, uh, uh, at least for advocates of the approach, um, is the idea of cost control and cost relief for consumers as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, there, there may be uh, supporters in the room of, of uh, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders' bill, Senator Sanders' bill. Um, you know, a, a plan that had no element of cost control, no global budget, no uh, regulated provider rates, I, I would think would not be appealing to most advocates of, of the idea of a public plan. So I'm going to ask one more question, then Larry, you can ask your question, which is related, which is, are we having this debate on an accelerated basis now because of concerns about guaranteed access, or is it about affordability? I mean, we have 91% uninsured or coverage rate right now. There is a plan in every part of the country. And I think going back to what is the goal here, Sherry, to your earlier presentation, I'm trying to understand what is the problem we're trying to solve so we can figure out in this array of options, why are these solutions emerging? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it's um, I think it's threefold. One one is uh, one is political. That that I, I suspect we would not be having this debate right now if the Affordable Care Act were not uh, under okay. threat politically. Um, uh, the second, I think it 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 is. I think it's pretty clear that the Affordable Care Act itself, with no changes, um, will not get much closer to universal coverage. Um, it's gotten uh, it's made tremendous progress. Uh, uh, really phenomenal progress in covering people, um, but it's it's not as currently structured 
going to get to fully universal coverage and frankly wasn't designed to. Which um, Peter Lee later this afternoon will dispute. Will yeah. we hear Peter say that? Uh, yes. Uh, and then and then. And then third is and then third is cost um, that um, uh, and there are lots of reasons why premiums have risen uh, in the individual market, um, uh, uh, in, including efforts to, to undermine um, the the marketplaces. Um, but I think the idea that premiums have risen substantially um, and the idea that the, the ACA did not provide cost relief to the vast majority of the population who are in employer based insurance um, is a big impetus. But just to pick up on that. If cost relief is the thing that is most of concern, then we should be thinking in a very different way than we are. So, I mean, if cost relief is the place we're trying to go, cost relief for ordinary people, that's a really different conversation than we've been having. Well, and I, I, I think, um, and Jean, Jean touched on this. I mean, so, so the idea, let's say, of expanding Medicare uh, to people um, over age 50. Um, which would represent a major uh, expansion in Medicare, arguably a, a sort of incremental step towards a, uh, a, a, a single payer system, Medicare for all. Um, as Jean said, that does nothing for uh, millennials, does nothing for people <coughs> with employer-based insurance, and it, it's, it's not clear that would have a lot of salience for, for the vast majority of the population. Uh, Larry, do you have a question? Uh, so, so I would pose you. Uh, you both talked about this idea of kind of, Chair, you did it in the international context of sort of uh, um, that, that other countries have ended up in very different places uh, from each other. Um, and Jean, you talked about the pathways. Um, so, sort of what, what would each of you imagine is, given that we already have a very embedded uh, mm -hmm. system, um, what does that pathway potentially look like? So, uh, I mean, is my mic on? Yeah. So my sense is that the pathway probably involves more of a fallback option than we have. I mean, in a more robust fallback option than we have now. I'm struck by countries that got to health insurance reform on the late side, places like Australia, basically run systems that are st structured around a strong, a robust, fairly large fallback option with private insurance layered over it. Um, lots of people are still in private insurance uh, and they, it looks like they've got pretty good cost containment going. They've got a lot of other positive virtues, but they haven't, they didn't basically move everybody out of what coverage they had into something else. Um, and I think that kind of layering approach is probably, I'm not absolutely saying this, I, you know, I, I, but probably the, the way that we will wind up going. And I would just add, going back to this affordability point, you know, I think we learn the hard way in implementing the Affordable Care Act this point of, you know, where do most people get their insurance today? Employers. And employer-based plans are not what we thought that they were back when we were passing the Affordable Care Act. We thought that they were better than they were. Turns out that there's a lot of coverage that was not quite so good. The changes were more enormous. And trying to get at the cost there, you have two choices. Try to make that coverage more affordable by with options like letting employers use Medicare rates for like a, like a, what do you call it, administrative services only idea, which is like what some people are thinking about, doing more reinsurance, doing something like that. But that's the way to embed more cost containment in those plans versus what we'll hear about in the next panel. Can we really give employers a choice between a private plan and a public plan? And how do you make that work without heavy government involvement? So I think that's, that to me is the most interesting debate, the one that needs to be pursued. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, and we have one from the audience. It's a little bit related to what we were just talking about. You know, the proposals on the table um, do potentially little to address the underlying costs of care and inefficiencies um, in delivery system. Do you, how do any of these options address that, and should there be some fifth option on the table that includes those considerations? So I, I think doing something about prices in the healthcare system has got to be on the agenda. It has to be on the agenda directly. Um, we are not going to save money in the healthcare system in any meaningful way simply by substituting public insurers for private insurers unless we do something about the prices that the insurers are actually paying uh, to providers. And that's a really tough problem because it, it, has, it pushes you up against entrenched interest groups. I think there are ways to 
do it, which I don't have time to talk about. But um, but I think it's it's absolutely got to happen, um, or we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, so um, I would agree. I think it's also really important to think about. Um, you know, as, as health policy experts, we tend to think about uh, the, the total cost of health care, and, uh, and certainly prices are completely central to that. Um, that is related to, but not necessarily the same as what uh, consumers and patients pay for health care. Um, and I think when thinking about cost relief, you, you, you have to think about both things. Uh, I mean, we could, you, you could make dramatic changes to the healthcare system and get prices down by 20 percent, uh, but if deductibles went up by 20 percent, uh, then consumers wouldn't exactly feel like you've given them relief. Great. Well, we will take a very brief 10-minute break, but first, let's thank our panelists for a great presentation. Thank you.